3. And we have made it to another chapter in this book without the rapture coming first. So we weren't sure when we began chapter 1. We've already made it through two chapters and we're still here. So we'll see how we do in, uh, in chapter 3. But again, uh, the fourth of uh, these uh, uh, churches that we're looking at, very, uh, very practical, so practical. I didn't know if anyone would come back this week, but uh, glad to see your smiling faces. Uh, I, I want to show you a video clip. It runs about two or three minutes. It's the beginning from the Ray Vanderland series, which is an excellent series of, uh, produced by Focus on the Family, a very good Bible teacher, and, and does his teaching on site. So uh, he's got a series uh, through different parts of, uh, of Israel. Uh, this one uh, came out a few years ago, and it covers... As you, as you can see, four of the uh, or five of the seven churches that we're looking at in Revelation. And so uh, I showed you on a map where they were located in Western Turkey last week. But this will actually show you a little bit and uh, show you the archaeological remains, which are pretty spectacular there at the church in, uh, in Sardis. So if we can go ahead. Through the fastest right there in Asia Minor. But uh, uh, again, I just wanted you to, I can talk about, it's a beautiful countryside, but of course to see it is quite different. I can talk about the incredible archaeological remains, some of the libraries that we've mentioned with over 200,000, over to me, over to plant series, over to excellence, over to, uh, over to my focus, over to link, over to good Bible, over to, and over to teaching, over to sites. So he's got a series through different parts of, uh, of this one, uh, a few years ago, covers, as you, as you can see, four of the, uh, or five of the seven churches that we're looking at, as you can see, cross, and that actually was a storefront. When they talk, that large building that you saw that they referred to as a gymnasium, again, in Greek or Roman times, the gymnasium wasn't a place where you worked out or lifted weights. That was called something else, located somewhere else. The gymnasium was the university. It was a university and a shopping mall all thrown, thrown into one. It was probably a pretty nice shopping mall with a lot of white marble and, and uh, lit at night and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and some of the cr early Christians in that community uh, took such a stand for Jesus Christ right on the front of their shop. They had a big cross carved right there. They wanted everybody to know that uh, I'm a Christian. I've taken a stand for Jesus Christ. I don't care if there's uh, one of the largest temples in this part of the world, uh, Artemis over there. I stand for Jesus Christ. So this is a very powerful church when it begins and when it's established. But by the time, and not very long, I mean, again, we're in about 95 AD at the time of, uh, of John's writing here. And by the time he comes along, uh, Jesus is saying to this church, I know you have a reputation, but you're dead. You're dead. I mean, this is kind of the, uh, the worst case scenario of the seven churches of, uh, of uh, Asia Minor. There, there will find out. There are a few that are still holding on and so forth. But for the most part, the church itself is, uh, is, is already dead. I wanted to kind of back this up a little bit more and to kind of help us see the theme of, uh, of what's going on in the letter. Tell you, I uh, can't ever resist, resist to tell a Chinese proverb. And then uh, got a little quote that goes along with it that uh, helps make the point. Uh, but uh, it's from... Uh, Feet of Clay by Gary Enrig, but he's uh, uh, talking about a Chinese proverb, true, uh, very well-known one, where there was an old man uh, in China, and uh, he had his farm and his home, and, and uh, out to the west of him were two mountains, and those mountains frustrated him. He didn't like them there, so one day he took his hoe, and he took his shovel, and he began to, to dig to remove the, the two mountains, uh, and one man came by and said, how silly. It's impossible for you to dig up those two mountains with just your, your little hoe. And the foolish man says, no, you don't understand. Uh, with, uh, with every shovel, I'm, I'm making progress. With every shovel, I'm removing. No, I won't get it done in my lifetime, but my children will continue. And my grandchildren and their children and their grandchildren. And eventually, these two mountains will be uh, removed. There's no reason why we can't clear them away. That's a very well-known Chinese proverb, obviously, about per perseverance. But at the same time, it was used by Mao Zedong uh, in 1945 to illustrate for him how China would rid itself of the two mountains of feudalism and imperialism. And when he seized power in 49, he attacked those mountains with tremendous determination. And he said, in time, uh, again, the, the problem would be 
with the sons and their sons and their sons continue. So in 1966, he unleashes what we now know historically as the Cultural Revolution. Now, uh, Gary says this about that event. He says, I'm no admirer of Mao Zedong. His satanic philosophy has kept hundreds of millions of people from the opportunity of hearing the good news of salvation. At the same time, I recognize Mao's keen insight into human nature regarding a pattern I call second generation syndrome. The second generation has a natural tendency to accept the status quo and to lose the vision of the first generation. Too often the second generation experience is a second hand experience. That syndrome operates in the spiritual realm as well as in the political. Church history is filled with examples of it and sadly so many churches. The parents' fervor for the Lord Jesus Christ becomes the children's formalism and the grandchildren's apathy. And that's what's happened in this church. The guys that established the church, the men and women, great faith, great courage, uh, they, they, they took a stand, a public stand, in a very difficult place for Jesus Christ. But by the time you get to the children and the grandchildren, this is the church that is, uh, uh, is completely dead. Now, there's a, a couple things. Uh, besides it being uh, beautiful and well-established, it was uh, a very wealthy uh, place in, in Greek times. It was the center or the capital of, uh, of that region in, in that area. There's a little phrase that, uh, that John uses uh, that uh, helps us understand, again, why Jesus writes a letter to this church. Again, we've said there were many churches in Asia Minor. Uh, we've looked at some of them on the map, but he picks seven uh, because of a particular reason or event or a setting in that particular uh, city. And this one uh, dates back all the way to the 6th century. Remember Cyrus of the Bible, Cyrus, who is the one that is uh, uh, named by Isaiah hundreds of years prior to his birth, and says that he's going to be a servant of the Lord. God's going to raise up to allow the people, uh, the children of Israel, to go back out of the Babylonian captivity under the Persians and go back into the land. That same guy, Cyrus, uh, as he's out conquering the world, has made his way uh, all the way into uh, to Asia Minor. And the, uh, the king, who was considered the wealthiest man of the world at the time, uh, Choresus, decides that uh, he is living in his walled city here in Sardis. He decides, I won't wait for Cyrus to get to me. I'll go to him. So he amasses his army. He marches across the, the mountains of Turkey, and he meets him on the plains on the other side, where, where Cyrus defeats him. And so Croesus makes it back and defeat back to the city once again of Sardis and believes uh, that he's fine there because he's, he's up on a hill, He's got a, a cliff behind him and three very la large wall, walls uh, around him. They can hold off anybody. It won't be a problem. Now, again, Cyrus, though he's already defeated him, decides that he'll uh, march across the mountains and go after him and actually take the city of Sardis, the city that we're talking about here this morning. So what he does, he comes and he realizes it's a walled city. He's kind of encamped. And the story goes that uh, one of his men is watching the wall, and there's two soldiers up there, and one of their helmets falls off, boom, 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 tumbles down. And the guy just simply throws a rope over the wall, comes down, and apparently there's a path. He grabs his helmet, duh, 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 goes back up, goes to Cyrus, and goes, I know how we can get in. There's a path that goes very high on this side. All we've got to do is get ropes up, and we can go right in. So that's what they do. And they take the city like a thief in the night. And that becomes what Sardis is known about. It's the city that is conquered like a thief in the night. Um, and it's not the only time that, that it happens. 300 years later, and Antiochus captures the city in the same way. And then a number of years later, the Romans did the same way. Sardis becomes known as a city that, that thinks that no one can, uh, can, uh, can conquer them. But the people that do come and they take them like a thief in the night. And so Jesus then... And talking to this city, a city that's known for their apathy because they think uh, that no one can conquer them. Their, their guards go to, are known for going to sleep at night on the wall instead of guarding. But when they are taken, it's like a thief in the night. And Jesus says, that's the way you are as a church. So that's the reason he picks this particular uh, city out uh, as well. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at our... In our text, again, verse 1 to 6, And to the angel of the church at Sardis write, 
<clears throat> These things say he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name <clears throat> from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who is an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So following approximately the outline we've looked at with some of the other churches here, we first note that he communicates his concern to the church in Sardis. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and seven stars. Again, going back to chapter one and the scripture of the glorified Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, again, uh, no mystery there. In verse 20, it says, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven gold menorahs or lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. So the seven stars here, rep again, representing the angels and of the seven churches that are going out to them. And uh, again, in verse 16, chapter 1, we, uh, we saw these seven stars, in a sense, in his right hand. The point of all of this is that right from the beginning, it's Jesus Christ that is inserting the fact that, by the way, did I mention this? I'm supposed to be the one in charge of your church. And, uh, and we get this kind of reoccurring thing. Uh, as, we, as he introduces each of these, these letters. Again, just as a, a human body is to be controlled by the mind, the church is to be controlled by Jesus Christ. And when your body is no longer able to be controlled by your brain, by your mind, we call that paralysis. Uh, it may be full or it may be partial, but no longer can function the way it was intended. And certainly that's true of the church as well. John's day and our day as well. Secondly, Jesus condemns the church by saying that they are dead. We note that he condemns the church because they had a false reputation. Their reputation was that they were alive. Apparently, they were, again, regarded by their contemporaries as being a really great church. <clears throat> he mentions their works, so they had a church full of activities. In fact, the parking lot was jammed every, every night, and they had these great T-shirts that says, Jesus is alive at Sardis, and people wore them all over town. Uh, it, it was just an amazing church. Uh, yet at the same time, again, death has apparently been a continual process in this church, and we see it historically. Pastor Chuck has said many times that a work of God begins with a man, uh, then becomes a movement, then a machine, and eventually a monument. Uh, this church, though, again, it's, it's barely, barely into the second, maybe the third generation. It's already into the monument stage. Uh, but yet Jesus says there's still hope even for a church like this. Uh, again, a church is, to, as opposed to being dead, is to be alive. Uh, something that is alive needs food. It needs to grow. It needs to be able to reproduce if it's healthy. Uh, and apparently this church is not doing that. Now, Jesus didn't give a, a direct explanation of his words saying that you are dead. But it's reasonable to believe that these Christians were apparently weak in these areas. Uh, like the cells of a body, they weren't working well together. When the cells of our body don't work well together, we call that cancer, when they're actually fighting against each other. So this, that's what's going on in this church, apparently. They apparently stopped taking in the right spiritual food, so they're not listening to the word of God or obeying the spirit any longer. And thirdly, they had stopped growing as a body. And again, we're not talking about numerically, we're talking about individuals growing. We often say that healthy sheep produce other sheep, and uh, that wasn't going on. So they're condemned by Jesus saying that, uh, that they're dead. But then he cautions them in verses 2 and 3 because he says it's, it's almost too late. He, he cautions them to strengthen the things that remain. He says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. So they're, they're, I guess there's a, they're almost dead. And uh, again... Uh, the things that the Bible tells us to be watchful over. And again, they had the walled cities, and they were, they, they were basically just apathetic. Uh, and yet at the same time, 
They, they were so unaware of the fact that, uh, that what, what awaited them, what was coming next, and needed to hear the words of Jesus to be, to be watchful, lest they are taken like the enemy the way the city was by Cyrus. Warren Wordsby says this, Nor did the Lord point out any doctrinal problems that required correction. Neither, there is any mention of opposition or persecution. The church would have been better off had there been some suffering. For it had grown comfortable and content and was living on its past reputation. There was reputation without reality, form without force. Like the city itself, the church at Sardis, glorified in past splendor, but ignored present decay. And so he tells them to wake up and, and strengthen. Now, Peter reminds us to be watchful, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he, he may devour. We need to be watchful and careful because there's an enemy out there. But I think the problem here is there's an enemy within <laughs> with, with, their, with their, own, their own apathy. I've met people that glory in the days of when they first got saved and how exciting it was, how great that church was, whatever that church might have been all that they did for the Lord, and so on and so forth. And their whole Christian experience, if you talk to them, is never is without her, is her, is city itself, is bridges are, is glorified, is splendor, is bidding her, is present her, is gay her, is so he her, is to, that is to up and that is to strengthen, that is to that is to just to be, that is to first Peter, that is to be sober, that is to jump because that is to be necessary, that is to walk, that is to be roaring, that is to be seeking whom not doing, he may do not doing, he need to be what not doing, careful because not doing, enemy out not doing, but I think not doing here, there's not doing it within, not doing it, not doing it with not doing thrown app. I like this, I like this people, I like this, I like this, I like this, and I like this, I like this, and they first, I like this. I like this, and how I like this was. I like this great. That that was whatever that that might have been. That's all that that's for the Lord. That's so on and so. That's and there. That's an experience. That's talk to. That's never. That's without. That's in the city itself. In the bridges are in the glorified. In the masculine. In the bidding. In the present. In the decay. In the so he in the two. In the up in sheep strengthen sheep. Sheep, just to be sheep. First Peter, sheep. Be sober, sheep. Gent because sheep. Adversary, the sheep. Walk sheep. Like a roaring sheep. Seeking whom sheep. He may devour. Almost too easy to be wild. Almost too careful because almost too enemy out. Almost too. But I think almost too scared. There's almost too within. Almost too. Almost too. With almost too thrown app. Almost too. I've almost too people. I guess. It, I guess. It, I guess. It, in. I guess. It is. I guess. When they first. I guess. It, I guess in how I guess it was. I guess the great that I guess it was whatever that enemy might have been. An enemy with all that enemy with for the Lord. An enemy with so on and so. An enemy with and there an enemy with an experience. An enemy would talk to an enemy was never an enemy with, without an enemy was an enemy with city itself. It's about like bridges are. It's about like glorified. It's about like masculine. It's about like bidding. It's about like present. It's about like hey. It's about like so he. It's about like to. It's about like up and. It's about like strengthen. It's about like and just to be and first Peter and be sober. And gent because and adversary and walks and take a roar and, and seeking whom and he may divide and see the be wide and me out there. There, there, there's there, 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 with their own eyes, people, people when they first came, and how, how great, great that was, whatever that for all the so in their own talker, never city itself, glorified, aspidic, present, so he took him and took up and strengthen. And just to be in First Peter, and be sober, and gent because and adversary, and walk, and take a roar, and, and seeking whom it's about like he may divide, it's about like he to be wise, it's about like careful because it's about like enemy out, it's about like but I think it's about like here, there's it's about like within, it's about like it's about like with it's about like own app, an enemy with I have an enemy with people, an enemy with an enemy with glue, an enemy with in an enemy ways, an enemy when they first an enemy with. An enemy with how it's an enemy was an enemy with great that I guess was whatever that I guess might have been I guess all that I guess for the Lord I guess so on and so I guess and there I guess in experience a very well sturdy built gate with that nice sign in front of it there was no fence <laughs> the only thing left was the was the gate and and the sign everything else was uh, overgrown and then she makes this comment the behavioral bounds of Christianity are good too. But if we don't restrict ourselves to live within them, they are no more effective than the gate without a fence. 
Sometimes it seems that we Christians hang up our signs, then quietly pull out the fence posts and roll up the bob wire, leaving only a semblance of morality with no substance. We don't leave the gate open, but we don't need to if we've taken the fence down. I think that's probably the case of the church, uh, church here. Again, think about the fact that, as we showed on the map, it's only maybe 20 miles away, 30 miles away, 40 miles away. Here's another church undergoing tremendous persecution, but we don't find that. No friction sometimes means no, no motion. One writer said, The unsaved in Sardis saw the church as a respectable group of people who were neither dangerous nor desirable. They were decent people with a dying witness and a decaying ministry. The, third, the second thing Jesus cautions them is to become mature in their works. He says, I have not found your works to be perfect before God. Now, up until now, all the other churches, Jesus commends them, commends them for their, their works and what they're doing. But here he says that you, you, you appear, in other words, a lot of activities going on, but what are the activities for? Are they activities towards leading people to the kingdom of God, to faith in Jesus Christ, or are they simply activities to keep people busy? Now, certainly there should be, be works in our lives. I uh, certainly don't agree with a lot of the uh, theology of John Calvin, but I do like his line that says, faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. If God's working in our lives, there, it, will, it will be seen. There will be fruit. Uh, but uh, what these guys are doing, there is activity, but uh, Jesus is questioning the purpose in the activity. The third thing about this uh, uh, caution is he cautions them to remember what they've heard and what they've received. Again, same could be said for us. Well, we, like them, we've heard the gospel. We've received the forgiveness of sins, and the power of the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. And Jesus says to them, do you remember what you heard and what you received? And I want to certainly want to suggest that they've, they've certainly probably forgotten possibly what they've heard, and they no longer even think about what they have received. <clears throat> the great commentator and preacher Donald Barnhouse says, <clears throat> in all ages the church has received and heard in the same way. When one is born again, one receives the Holy Spirit. He comes to dwell in the human heart. The receiving has to do with the person of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as he comes in all his fullness to take up his abode in the believing heart, which becomes his temple. Believers are to remember this. 40,000 delegates to one of the greatest denominations meeting at a general convention heard their leaders state their part of their purpose in gathering was to devise business methods by which the Holy Spirit of God may be regulated and made efficient. How could such a statement ever have been made if the speaker had obeyed the injunction of this verse and remembered how the Holy Spirit was received? He is not a machine to be regulated. He is a person to take control. We can be aware of the theology, but are we really lending ourselves to the control and the power of, of the Holy Spirit? Do we remember what we've heard and what we've received? And I think that's probably a big problem in the church here at Sardis. I uh, also want to just point out that it's the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and takes control of our lives, desires, desires to for a purpose. It's for a reason. I mean, otherwise, we just when somebody got saved, they just kind of get raptured, just individually <laughs> raptured. I like that concept, though. <laughs> Uh, get saved, pray, and hey, I'm just with the Lord. That's good. But no, he leaves us here. Yeah, and it's for a reason. It's so easy to forget. <clears throat> Some of you are too young to remember this. Back, back in the Mexico Olympics in 1968 at 7 p.m. one evening, there was a huge crowd left in the stadium because they were waiting for the finish of the marathon. The people that won the race had finished uh, hours before. But uh, they had become aware through the media and the stadium and elsewhere that uh, one of the runners had become injured. His name was John Stephen uh, uh, Aquara, and, uh, and he, uh, though was injured, got his leg that was damaged, bandaged it back up, and just kept hobbling uh, along. So uh, he was the last contestant to finish the 26-mile contest, uh, contest with his uh, leg bandaged. Uh, when he finally entered the stadium, the spectators rose, applauded as if he were the winner. And uh, they interviewed him after the race. 
and asked him, uh, you know, why, what kept you going, you know, that, uh, that you would, you know, just want to finish the race, though it was so grueling. And he said, my country did not send me 7,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 7,000 miles to finish the race. We can forget what we've, what we've heard and what it's really done in our lives. Yeah, the Lord forgives us of all of our sins. He gives us the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be yielding our lives to that spirit, and it's for a reason, uh, and it's for a purpose. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says concerning the race we're to run. And um, just want to point out that uh, the Apostle Paul apparently watched ESPN on a regular basis because he's quite a sports fan. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? But only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. You get that? Paul says, if you're going to enter the thing, enter to win. Not just to have participated somehow. Enter and train like you want to win the thing. Uh, verse 25. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. That means they limit their activities. They limit their diet. They, uh, they, they take on a different lifestyle because now their life has a different meaning and a different purpose. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight or box like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize like the church in Sardis. So again, he communicates a concern. He condemns the church by saying they're dead. He cautions them because he's saying it's almost too late. And then fourth thing, Jesus does not conceal his swift judgment that is coming soon. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I'm coming. This is not talking about the rapture of the church. This is talking about an incident in the city, a phrase that they would all be familiar with and they would know exactly what he's talking about. When uh, Cyrus and those guys came over the wall, it wasn't to throw a party, <laughs> right? He's, he's talking about coming in, uh, in, in judgment. Uh, and the point is that Jesus is saying that the end will come much quicker than you think. Now, uh, if they're true believers in Jesus Christ, and we're going to find out some of them are, they're going to be with the Lord, regardless of the condition and what's going on and their lack of meaning, their lack of purpose, forgetting what they've heard at the beginning, not, not really being a strong witness. In the, sure, they are. Uh, but the point Jesus is saying, I'm going to come and it's going to come very rapidly. The end will come very quickly. And um, I've uh, surveyed many people over this, and I just want you to know as you get older, time moves faster. <laughs> if you're not sure, think about what, how long summers were when you were in the fifth grade, you know, for a really long time. And now the years just kind of fly, fly by. And Jesus is saying, the end of your life will come much quicker than you have anticipated. And certainly... Uh, the Proverbs bear that out on, uh, on many things that Solomon has to say about, about life. And even it was uh, David that said, Lord, te teach me the brevity of life and how short that it uh, that really is. And uh, I, uh, I was thinking about this this week, and I remembered a phone call I got, and it has actually been several years ago. It was, by, it was from a woman. She was about, she was 84. She called uh, here, and I picked up the phone, and began to talk with her, and she was uh, in a hospital, and she was not expected to, uh, to live much longer. Uh, she was terminal, and she described for me her condition and so forth, and we chatted for a bit, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, maybe she's at Castle or she's at Queens or something, and I'll, I'll try to run over and, and see her, and uh, know, which hospital are you in, ma'am? And we're talking, and she's on the mainland somewhere. She's like 3,000 miles away, and I oh, okay, and I don't even know how she got my number, but, you know, I went ahead, and she asked me if I'd read her Psalm 23, which I was more than happy to do, and prayed with her, and, uh, and so forth, and I, I hung up the phone, and I thought, I don't want that to be me. I don't want that to be me. I'm at the end of my life, and the best I can do is just start dialing numbers and hope I get a hold of a pastor, that I don't even have a church. There's, there's no one there that, that would just come see me, because I've drifted so far away from where I really should have been, which is kind of the gist of part of our conversation. 
uh, that, uh, that evening. But uh, Jesus doesn't conceal the fact that his swift judgment is coming. It will come much sooner than they all expect. So he tells them to repent of their apathy, to remember what they have received, and then to strengthen what remains. The fifth thing, he promises the eternal compensation, as he has with the other churches as well, and some very, very wonderful statements that are made here in, in verses 4 to 6. Compensation begins with an encouragement. You have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So again, the overcomers, as we've gone, we won't turn there again. First John, overcomers are those that have placed their faith uh, in, in Jesus Christ, saved by his grace and his grace alone. So all these things that are promised to the overcomers at the end of all these letters are really for all believers. But notice in this church, it's only a few. It's not most of the church. Uh, it's only a few who have, he says, not defiled their garments, but uh, again, which speaks about their relationship with, with Jesus Christ. And then he talks about being in uh, this idea of being found uh, worthy, which is uh, uh, a very interesting word in the, in, in the Greek and the New Testament. Now, sometimes we think of, uh, uh, in, in the wrong sense, worthy for them meant if you took a, it was a business term, if you bought something in a market, they would put a scale and they would put a weight on this end they put the merchandise on this end, and they would keep countering balancing until they could, oh, that's how much the weight is, so we can determine the price. Once it was perfectly in balance, then it was worthy. So now we can determine the price. So he uses this phrase, Jesus uses it here, to talk about the fact that, that he's found them worthy. You're, you're balanced. Whatever your life is like, whatever your sins have been, my blood and my righteousness makes you worthy. You're completely in balance. I found you worthy. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, again, says these things to us as though we've done something? But the statement is he's, say, he's telling us what he's done for us. Uh, and because of that, he says that, uh, secondly, you'll be clothed in a, in a white garment. Now, Isaiah 64 tells us that in that same comparison that uh, we're like filthy rags. Paul tells us in Romans 13 that we should be put on, be being put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and of course, as Isaiah 118, we, we sing the song sometimes, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as, uh, as snow. The third thing in the compensation includes the fact that our names are written in the book of life. And he says about it that they will not be, be blotted out couple of, uh, of verses, and, and if you're not familiar with this, basically uh, the book of life is uh, spoken of many times in, in the Bible, several times in the book of Revelation, and it's how you get into heaven. <laughs> Your name must be written uh, in the Lamb's book of life. Remember the disciples, the first time Jesus sends them out and he gives them power and authority uh, over evil spirits and to heal and so forth, uh, and they go out and they're rejoicing when they come out because of all these incredible things that, that have taken place as they've gone out and said, the Messiah is here. The kingdom of God is, has come and so forth. And they've cast out demons and healed people. And they're excited about that. And Jesus says, don't rejoice over that, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. It's a reference to this idea of the, the book of life. Revelation 13, a couple of chapters to your right there, verse 8 says, all who dwell, and again, this is talking about uh, during the tribulation period as we move to that uh, soon here in our studies. But during the tribulation period, talking about those who will end up worshiping the Antichrist, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose, whose names have not been written in the book of the life, excuse me, the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation uh, of the world. Uh, their names are not written in it. That's important to note, and that's, that's why they end up, again, bowing their knee to the Antichrist. The other thing we see about the book of life here and other places, always directly tied to Jesus Christ. It's the Lamb's book of life. Uh, it's because of what he's done for us. And then again, we place our faith in his finished work on the cross, receive his grace, and our late names are then in that book. Many other verses, but again, one more, 21, 27 of Revelation. But there shall be by no means enter it, speaking of heaven, anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, 
but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So again, who will enter heaven? Jesus says, you will because I've made you worthy and I've written your name uh, in the Lamb's book of, book of life. I don't, I don't know if it has a lot of meaning to you or not. I, uh, I kind of had this uh, illustrated to me, or the Lord kind of remind me of this uh, one time, a uh, very long time ago. Kathy and I were uh, just uh, married, and um, uh, we, <laughs> so, uh, we didn't have your typical honeymoon. Actually, I, I was already signed up to take a, uh, a workshop for two weeks that uh, was going to be held at UC Berkeley with what uh, is probably continues to be the the most notable stained glass designer in, in the world today, a West, West German, I still say West German, a man named Ludwig Schafroth. And he, uh, he came, would come to travel the world occasionally and put on design workshops. And it was one of those things you had to send slides, of, this was back in the day, slides of your, of your work and then get accepted into this thing. And there was uh, people there from different parts of the country. And, and uh, I felt very honored to... to to get in, it just happened to coincide with our wedding date, and the, so we we got married, jumped on a plane, and went uh, to California. And then uh, every day I went. It was an eight-hour, nine-hour day thing, Monday through Friday. And she would come and hang out sometimes, and then shop all the little stores there in Berkeley and stuff. But uh, it was a great opportunity to, to be with this man, and I had read all about him and seen all of his books and his works all, all over the world. And uh, and uh, I could point out to you. Uh, things that you see in the media today that are a direct influence of his particular design style. Uh, but uh, we went through this class with him for two weeks, and there was like maybe 14 people in it. It wasn't, wasn't very big. And um, at the end of that time, he had to go lecture somewhere for a day, and so he had another uh, very well-known stained glass designer, a gal that lived in the area, come and oversee the class that day. Her name was Shelley Jurors, and I knew who she was as well. She had actually gone to Aachen, Germany, and actually stayed there with his family for, um, I don't know, <laughs> eight months or so, being personally discipled by, uh, by him. So she came that day, and she was talking about how much uh, this class uh, means to him, and about how he, he was discipled by, uh, started out as a painter, and uh, uh, how he was discipled by uh, another very famous German painter, and he could never get over that, that that guy would take the time with him. So he's always felt like he wanted to kind of give back, in a sense, learn to speak English so that he could, it wasn't real good, he could have had to hang in there with the, uh, remember he'd always say the word, devilment, development, but you just kind of had to train your ear after a while. But uh, learn to speak English just so he could do this. And, uh, and then, and that when he returns uh, back to uh, Germany in his uh, very large studio, the basement of his house, there's a big blackboard there where there are a few names, and he will go back and he will write all of our names on that blackboard. And, uh, and he will watch and listen, and if we write or we want more feedback and so on and so forth, uh, I don't know if this is, this is like going and study with Picasso if you're a painter or something. I don't know how to, uh, <clears throat> how to frame this in terms of the, uh, the importance of this guy. But, um, but that really struck me that he would, uh, that he would do that. <clears throat> after that, I was reading, and not long after that, I was reading this verse. And that, you know, I was all excited <laughs> because this very famous stained glass designer had written my name at his blackboard in Germany in his basement, you know. There's a little more impact here, that Jesus has written our names uh, on, in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he has the capacity to be quite keenly aware, of course, of every one of us and where we're at in terms of our relationship with, with him. And it's the only way that you enter heaven if, is if your name is written there. And again, it's... This is not a great outstanding church that he's mentioning these eternal compensations. These are, this is just church is dead. But he says, even in your midst, there's some that still have not soiled your garments in terms of my relationship with you. Uh, the other compensation is uh, powerful as well and includes Jesus confessing your name. It will be before the Father and before the, the angels. Of course, it's back in Matthew 10 that he said to his disciples, therefore, 
Whoever confesses me before men, him also I will confess before my Father who is in, in heaven. What a powerful thing to... Um, you think that being in heaven, you're going to be going, am I really here? <laughs> is my name really in, uh, in that book? Is this really, really hap happening? You know, and then to have Jesus you know, kind of uh, confess you know, be, before uh, when, uh, <clears throat> when, you know, when Josh first got in the Air Force Academy, it was kind of, uh, it, was, it was a big deal, obviously, but it was, a, it was interesting because he did not get in right out of high school and took his ROTC scholarship and went to HBU and did well here uh, locally and uh, with the uh, ROTC here and then reapplied. <clears throat> and then you wait. It's like pins and needles from like January and, uh, until you know, about late February, March, it gets a big, big March, you're kind of waiting for that letter, you're checking every, every day, you know, to see if uh, you're going to hear, and this is, again, if you're qualified, one in ten are going to get in, uh, and then nothing's coming, nothing's coming, it's getting later and later, uh, and then it's, it's April 1, it's April Fool's Day, and we get a phone call from Congressman Ed Case at about 8.15, Josh starts school at 8, I pick it up, hi, this is Congressman Ed Case, and I didn't think he was calling to say he didn't get in. But, he, but we weren't expecting a call. And he says, hey, I need to talk to Josh. Very important. And I was like, uh, he's at school, but um, I'll get him. <laughs> Drive to school, pull him out of his class. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, um, and, and they, they're all praying for him. It's uh, get to the principal's off, cause the head case. Josh, I want to know you've, uh, uh, you've been offered... Um, you know, to uh, the opportunity to go to the United States Air Force Academy, da da da, da class of 09. <laughs> it goes through this whole thing. Oh, thank you very much, Congressman Case. And, and he says, but I need to tell you something, is that there's a letter coming to you that's going to say you didn't get in. And that letter was sent out prior to my getting a phone call from the Academy saying that you did get in. Well, okay. So it's a little like, okay, I got a phone call. It's on April Fool's Day. <laughs> From this guy, sure sounds like Ed Case, you know, but, but there's going to be a letter. He gets the letter that day, that afternoon it comes. Denied. You did not get in. No, that's okay because, you know, <laughs> no, no, he called. It's, we're cool. But it's like, uh, I remember we went up there for orientation and because uh, we just happened to be visiting Kathy's uh, uh, parents, uh, our brother there in Denver, right at the time they were having an orientation weekend. And so Josh flies up with his mileage, but... But I can tell you, standing there with them in line, when you get in that line and you got all those kids up there and they're going through looking for your name, it's like Newman, Joshua, Curtis. Yes, sir, here's your number. Step right over here. It's just kind of like, ooh. <laughs> okay, this is really happening here. I don't know if heaven will be like that or not, but I think it might be a little bit. I think it'll be so overwhelming to then to have Jesus confess your name individually before the Father and, and all the angels. I think it'll be an incredible moment. And uh, again, writing to a church in a very difficult place to be a Christian. But their problem was not persecution. Their problem was apathy. They had just forgot they'd been Christian so long or they were into that next generation. And they'd really forgotten. And Jesus is saying, it's not too late. But the end is going to come a lot faster than you think. It's going to be like a thief in the night. And the end of your life is going to be like that. For us, it's either going to be the rapture or whatever it might be. When the end comes, though, it's going to be too quickly. Uh, and again, the only regrets that you and I will ever have is, is not that we didn't work longer or harder. It's, uh, it's going to be all about what we did or did not do for our families and for Jesus Christ. I've been with a lot of people moments before they were in the presence of God, and that's always what they all say every time. Looking back, I wish I had done more for the Lord. And that's guys that have like served the Lord wholeheartedly and some that did very little for the Lord. That's always the concern. And I think that's a, a good place for us to realize. But again, the cautioning and uh, the concern of Jesus Christ.